Hey folks, Kiltman here, Kiltman, at your life force saving services. How are you all? Hope you're doing well. Can you hear it? Of course you can. What is it? Henry Mancini's fabulously OTT and extravagant main title theme and march from 1985's epic sci-fi extravaganza, Life Force. Henry Mancini, of course. Breakfast at Tiffany's, The Pink Panther. Who the hell would get him to score a film about space vampires and a nude French actress called Matilda May waltzing around Hyde Park and all London environs, sucking the life force out of nubile people? Well, Golden Globus and Canon Films would do. And a great movie it was too. Apparently, director Toby Hooper of Texas Chainsaw Massacre, who was commencing a three-picture deal with Canon Films, which would be a disaster for him. Um, Texas Chainsaw Massacre Part 2, Invaders from Mars, and this was going to be that triumvirate. None of which received a welcome upon release but have all gone on to get a cult following ever since. Cheers y'all. But he wanted James Horner to provide the score. Understandable, James Horner had just done two Star Trek movies. He had Krull and Brainstorm and Wolfen in the bag as well. Commando. So, you know, but no, he got Henry Mancini. And what a great score it is too. But because the film Life Force was so butchered upon production, because Golden Globus, these what Israeli cousins and film magnates, couldn't keep their fingers out the filmic pie, could they? They went in, they meddled, they chopped, and they changed, but the score didn't really work in the end. So, and there's two versions of the movie as well: the American cut, which runs shorter and even more confusedly, than the international cut, which has a, a lot more going on and makes. A little bit more sense. Not a whole lot, but a little bit more. And because the score was chopped and changed, they brought in Michael Kamen, the great late Michael Kamen, to add a lot more stuff to it. As this review goes on of Life Force, you may hear bits of Michael Kamen creep in now and again. But for now, I'm going to turn down, which is a shame, that fabulous score from Henry Mancini. Life Force. 1985, based upon a 1976 sci-fi novel called The Space Vampires by Colin Wilson. Colin Wilson who wrote crime stories and liked H.P. Lovecraft and tried to bring in a little bit of Lovecraft into a space yarn. So the space vampires in his story have actually been here way before and formed the folklore of our own mythological vampire creatures on Earth. But they're aliens, and his story, which by the way, is here, and yes, that's the film tie-in publication. Colin Wilson, Life Force, featuring Matilda May. But it actually says here, the space vampires now filmed as Life Force. And Life Force actually isn't a bad title. Golden Globus actually said at the time, we can't call it space vampires. That sounds like a cheap and nasty little exploitation flick that we'd normally come out with starring Charles Bronson. So let's call it mm, Life Force. And Life Force, as I say, is not a bad title because that's what these vampires do. They don't suck the blood, they drain the life force out of their victims. But we'll come on to that. The film is directed by Toby Hooper, Texas Chainsaw Massacre. Although it really doesn't feel like a Toby Hooper movie. It is so slapdash, slipshod, it's OTT energetic, then really sluggish, then massively OTT again, and then, oh, what's going on? It's just a complete riot of explosions and special effects, and none of it makes any sense. It does not feel at all like the claustrophobic terror of Toby Hooper's you know, infamy. Two Texas Chainsaw Massacre movies, Poltergeist, yeah, with Spielberg's you know, heavy involvement, uh, Funhouse, and of course, Salem's Lot. Very, very eaten alive, very similar in style, but this is much bigger. It's brash, it's got space, it's got cities, it's got numerous locations, it's got a huge cast in it. 
does not at all feel like a Toby the movie. It's written by um, Dan O'Bannon. Dan O'Bannon from Dark Star and John Carpenter Days, and of course, Dead and Buried, and um, what's the big one? Eternal Living Dead, Alien. Yeah, there you go. And Life Force definitely has got the influence under its belt of Ridley Scott's movie. But Dan O'Bannon and uh, Dan Jacoby would do Invaders from Mars, they'd do Blue Thunder, and they would do this. And it takes as a clear antecedent the original story by Colin Wilson. All the ideas are there, but none of them work. <laughs> not, they, it's a crash test of just exploding notions and ideas and concepts which go absolutely nowhere. This is a, a huge bastardised love child of Hammer, Lovecraft, Doctor Who, Quatermass, and yet it works. It works on such an energetic and enthusiastic level of complete kitsch camp buffoonery that it's irresistible. Well, it's irresistible because you've got zombies running amok, you've got some great over-the-top performances, you've got some reasonable visual effects for its time, some great prosthetic effects, some dismal stuff as well. But you've also got Matilda May in the nudie nudes throughout most of the movie. Apparently she didn't, uh, she didn't know there'd be that much nudity in it and was it, had a lot of reservations about the whole thing. Understandable. But when you see the results of the nudity, enough said. But she is absolutely adorable. And she does, you know, epitomise this alluring, seductive creature from, you know, beyond cosmos that adopts this fantastic female form to obviously entrance and enrapture her victims. Anyway, the story is we're back in 1985 and Halley's Comet's coming around again. And Halley's Comet was about to come around again when the film was coming to production. Coming around every 70 odd years, Halley's Comet. And a, a co British and American space shuttle exploration, you know, expedition launches to go and investigate Halley's Comet. But it finds something else. They kind of forget about the comet in the end because they find a 150 mile long spacecraft there. 150 mile long and two miles high. And then they go on a spacewalk, this combined unit of astronauts. And they find the one entrance which takes them into this huge uh, denizen of like a cemetery of all these huge bat-like creatures who are just floating in the uh, in space. Our main, can't call him a hero, he ain't no hero, but our main protagonist, American astronaut, who's also the, uh, the leader of the expedition, uh, Commander Carlson, played by Steve Railsback, yes, of Charlie Manson fame, and Turkey Shoot, and a few other things. The stuntman. Not the world's greatest actor, but he... He does bring something, let's put it that way. I ain't sure what, but he brings more than enough of it. Uh, he goes, he floats up to one of these things, and it, it's bat-like things, and snaps a finger off. Completely desiccated. And then in another chamber they find three bodies, perfect, in these sort of crystalline sarcophagi. Two male, sadly, and only one female. But that, that one female is Matilda May. And they bring these back on board the Churchill, the space shuttle, for a further investigation. And we will learn that an influence, an evil influence, has invaded the minds of the other astronauts. People are going crazy and bodies are found completely desiccated. You know, just drained of all life. So Carlson, in the end, realises... Now, you don't get told this until later in the movie because the way things transpire, Churchill wanders back towards Earth, Earth's orbit and the European Space Research Centre under Michael Gothard, the great Michael Gothard, and uh, Frank Finley, of all people, Frank Finley, as Dr. Falada, a, a, you know, a, a god of pathology. I think what the hell he's doing with this space programme, but anyway, he is. They send up another shuttle to go and dock with this and find out what's happened. When they get in there, a bit like aliens, the salvage crew, they find that all the body, the whole thing's been burnt out. Everyone's just to totally flambéed. 
but they find these alien three bodies totally okay and they bring them back to air and of course they can't make out what's been happening and then of course Carlson suddenly arrives Carlson has actually he's the one who blew up set fire to the shuttle and in the last escape pod has took off and landed in a very rainy Texas where he's immediately brought back to the Space Center in London because he alone must know what's been going on there and he talks about the influence of this female body that they found that it gets control of the mind and he's in love on a level you couldn't comprehend he keeps on saying this listen we've all been teenagers we've all been in love on a level that you think no one else can comprehend but he really is and uh, but of course in the meantime these vampires they're not dead are they of course the female wakes up puts the uh, the suckage on the chops of the, the nearest security guard drains him of all life and makes him end up looking like that Ooh. ain't pleasant and then he's dead but after two hours he wakes up and he needs more life force to drain to try and stay alive and after two hours if you don't get that life force in you boom ski you explode in a shower of ash and dust so the female has all has now escaped from the space center she's blown out all the windows she's strutting around Hyde Park totally in the buff Carlson alongside Sir Percy Hesseltine I think what's his name, James Aubrey, I think his name is. And uh, <laughs> and Peter Fair playing Commander Kane. Commander Kane of the SAS. Gentlemen, that last bit's not for publication. This is a D notice situation. What the fuck is a D notice situation? And since when can you tell the world's press that, you know, that's not for publication and they're going to listen to you? <laughs> but he is Commander Kane of the SAS. Now, Peter Fair. No relation to Colin Firth, I don't think. He uh, he was in Letter to Brezhnev. He was in Equus. As my wife keeps telling me, he was also in the 1970s kids TV show, The Double Deckers, playing Scooper. <laughs> and he's this little SAS man in a raincoat. And <laughs> Him and Carlson now realise that, look, the female, because Carlson has this connection, this empathetic connection to the female, they are in love on a level you couldn't comprehend. Don't forget that. That's very important. And she's now gone cross country. She's been draining people and assuming different identities. She can shape shift as well. That's the thing. The film doesn't really make that too really clear. It's mentioned and you clearly see it, but it's not really hammered home, if you know what I mean. And they pursue her to a, an insane asylum, and which is headed up by Patrick Stewart, Dr. X, Jean-Luc Picard. And uh, in a weird little twist, which is one of the film's most notable moments, Steve Railsback, Commander Carlson, with his empathetic relationship with the female vampire, knows that, hang on, it's not the guy you're trying to tell me it is, the big birthmark-faced paedophile in cell number whatever. It's actually you. So they inject him and they hypnotise him. And in this shocking sequence, Railsback, Commander Carlson sees the female vampire and he's talking to her and she's imploring him and luring him in. But in actual fact, we see him snogging. Yep. Yeah. Jean-Luc Picard, <laughs> Patrick Stewart, puts the lips on him. Patrick Stewart dies. Sir Percy Hasseltine has been killed as well in, in that ensuing chaos of this hypnot hypnotistic, hypnot this weird man-on-man -man snogged session. And in the, the waiting army helicopter, the two bodies are there, and they hear news from the pilot that, you know, we, the PM needs to see us now. London's in chaos. Something else has happened. This is, everything's gone crazy in London. But the two bodies there, all of a sudden, blood pours out of the two mouths and the eyes and the ears of these two corpses and form this huge living blood bubble, which becomes a sort of snake-like version of Matilda May. All, co all completely composed of gore and when the pilot sees it prior the helicopter shakes and rattles and rolls like the 50s and then oh, this huge blood bubble hits the deck and like they realize shit 
everything's going wrong. They speak to Frank Finley's Dr. Falada, who says that the two male vampires had awoken and caused chaos. And like they've escaped as well. So all London is now under martial law. What we're gonna do, people are the streets are running rife with people who've been infected and have got two hours to infect somebody else to get some life force out of them to live a bit longer. So it's just, it's almost, I would say George Romero, but it's more like Return of the Living Dead. The zombies actually, if you call them zombies, they do look, the infected do look like the zombies from Return of the Living Dead. Very apt, because it's, you know, Dan O'Bannon did both movies. But um, they get to see the, the PM, the, the, London's in absolute crisis. They go and land at the PM, sort of this little emergency headquarters, a Cobra headquarters maybe. And they've got these maps and charts on the walls, and people are oh, oh, loosening their ties and like sort of collapsing because everyone's infected. And then you go and see Miss Havisham. Uh, and Miss Havisham says, the, the, the PM will see you directly. Could I give you a cup of tea in the meantime? Uh, no, let's just see the PM. We've got something very important to tell him. We've learned a lot more about these vampires and what they're up to and why they're doing this. And like the PM comes out and uh, he's all sweaty and he's wiping his nose and rubbing his eyes and yeah, well, we know. And like he says, uh, gentlemen, I'll, I'll see you shortly. Uh, Prime Minister, this is very important news. We've got to speak to you immediately. Um, no, uh, let me just speak with Miss Havisham and then I'll be back to you. I, I, I promise. I promise. Miss Havisham. Miss Havisham. <laughs> Like 40 towers, and like the, he takes her into his office. Aye, aye, and she's quite a nice thing. And uh, but he leaves the door ajar. So the, these are two illustrious, you know, sci fi detectives lean round and have a look. And he's took Miss Havisham behind this big map, notice board, whatever. Miss Havisham, come here, <laughs> shower the blue sparks. They realize, shit, shut the door, leg it. Get in the helicopter as a bunch of like squaddies, infected squaddies, pure zombie faces, leg it out and leap onto the air, the landing you know, struts of the helicopter. One of them just pulls the skin off his hand and falls off. Another one gets a flare pistol fired into his chest, lands in the Thames. But all hell has now broken loose in London. And obviously, it could be the rest of the world. They land at some staging area, a staging post manned by lots of British shoulders. Sh sh lots of British shoulders. There's all shoulders there, only a couple of heads. Lots of British military are there. And they're saying, I'm Commander Kane, you know, I'm well, of the SAS. This is Colonel Carson, you know, he's from the Churchill Space Shuttle. And this British major's like, no, I don't care who you are, you know, you must stay there for two hours quarantine. We know that two hours could elapse and in that time you could become infected and you must stay there. And they're talking to his friends, they go, well, what, what about that big spaceship from Halley's Comet? And he just goes, oh, oh, that, that's parked itself in geostationary orbit above London. That's an afterthought. 150 mile long spaceships parked itself above London. What? Anyway, what's happening now is Matilda May has secreted herself in the bowels of St. Paul's Cathedral. And all these riots in the streets and resulting in lots of people dying, the life forces being erupted. One of the, the, one of the male vampires is guarding the front entrance and he's acting like a channel. All the, this blue river of lights is going through him and then going into her and then going up to this spaceship which has opened its front part into this big umbrella like that, or as they call it, a collector, a collector of souls. And they're being brought up into this via hair. Now, Carlson, Steve Railsback, the astronaut, who's in love with her on a level you couldn't comprehend, um, he commandeers a vehicle and plows through the streets of London trying to get to her. Commander Kane, SAS man, don't mention that, this is a denoted situation goes after him and uh, both of them run into like hordes of these zombified you know crowds but Steve Railsback gets down to meet her and of course the two of them start doing the dirty all over again because they're in love on a level you couldn't comprehend and why are you doing this to me why are you doing this to me what do you want from me Steve Railsback saying well, 
man, shut up and just get on with it. Enjoy it while it lasts. And in the meantime, um, SAS man, Commander Kane, has gone to see Dr. Falada, Frank Finley. Dr. Falada has been the one expounding all the folkloric myths. He now says, you know, Kane, these have been here before. You know, these are the, the basis of the vampire myth on our planet. But I've learned how to kill them because in a great sequence, which I hadn't mentioned until now, the two male vampires wake up and down in this basement of the European Space Center, they've got this endless array of offices, wall to wall, window to window, glass, glass, glass. So to get anywhere, you've got to open these doors and go through glass, 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 glass. But these two male vampires arise and two paras, two Parachute regiment squaddies are there. Do you reckon they're dead? Well, that's what the doctor says. Says they're dead. Don't look bloody dead to me. Boom! Another boom ski. There's lots of boom skis in this movie. They come up. These two guys with foul mass assault rifles, which they wouldn't have, but they look a bit more space, space age, so a kind of special forces weapon. They're not. Just put all around and, and, and then in a great military moment, and I love that kind of shit, you know, because I'm part military. Um, they put enough rounds down, right, that's it, no good. And without any, any word being said, they both get grenades out, I'll lash grenades at them, ba boom! Again! <laughs> but they haven't killed them because these vampires assume the bodies of these two soldiers, and that's how they get out and infect London. So one of them's guarding the entrance of St. Paul's and the other one has gone to attack uh, Dr. Falada, who's realised, ah, yeah, I can tell that look in your face, you're not human anymore. So when Commander Commander Kane, Colonel Kane, SAS guy, one's a commander, one's a colonel, ah, fuck it, whatever. Uh, there's a great big iron sword through his chest and like, Frank Finley says, like, uh, I killed them the old way, the old fashioned way, you know, a stake through the heart, not made of wood, made of iron, and not through the heart, through the energy center, two inches below the heart. Why be, <laughs> why not just keep it as the heart? It'd be a lot easier, wouldn't it? You know, that keeps the folklore myth going. Anyway, but Falada has been infected too, and in one of those hammy moments, which Frank Finley, a Shakespearean actor for God's sake, it clearly relishes, he goes, he's got his face all starts bubbling and he goes, time to go. <laughs> and he erupts and his, his life force goes off, you know, obviously channeled and then sent up to the umbrella in geostationary orbit. So Commander Kane grabs this fucking sword, goes through the crowds of zombies again. In a great moment, you know, he has to leg it from his horde running after him like that. Oh. Debris falls down, blocking him from them. Flames are everywhere. Turns around and wands behind him. Goes, Aah! bang! Oh, fucking takes him out. Gets to St. Paul's. Manages to put the fucking sword through this great big vampire, who then becomes a bat-like creature. Then he manages to get the air uh, with the sword and sling it down to Steve Rails back. Commander Carlson, who in the uh, he's on the in love on a level you couldn't comprehend. Manages to put the sword through the two of them. And then the two life forces go up to this umbrella, which then closes and the ship, whoosh, ooh, off we go. So end of an absolutely gloriously stupid and yet immensely good fun movie. This film is a, a fucking big mess. The script is all over the show. Whichever version you watch, the script is all over the show. Colin Wilson's novel, the, these three vampires are actually criminals. Because the vampire race from Rigel number whatever, have a, you know, light years away, have been here on Earth and absorbed life forces, but love the planet. But they've all left and gone back and tried to find other planets on their way back home because they need life forces. But they do love our planet. And, uh, but these three have escaped, well, well, that ship escaped, shall we say. So the criminals, so they come back to try and get these guys back because you know, they're not meant to be back here. So, and you get, all the, you get all the history of these aliens 
and it's very Quatermass. It's very um, Lovecraftian because they're like old gods, the elder ones, you know? Very, very similar to Lovecraft. And so the film becomes Hammer meets Quatermass meets Lovecraft meets Doctor Who. The Doctor Who influence is great because all these squaddies are very, very like unit. You know, the old military. I used to love the Tom Baker ones and the Sean Pertwee ones where... No, John Pertwee, that's the one. John Pertwee, where unit were involved. Oh, it just gave it a bit more oomph, I always thought. Soldiers fighting monsters. The effects are wonderful for their time. The visuals can be a bit shaky, but for their time they were great. The prosthetics are wonderful and they're very similar to the effects that you see in Eternal Living Dead. Again, that similarity there. Matilda May takes out a woman on um, in Hyde Park and these two snotty teens have been watching it because and they're a report of what's happened and of course all this, you know, everyone converges on the spot and finds this, this desiccated, again, corpse of this nude woman which they bring in for an autopsy. And he said, like, uh, well, tell me again what you saw. Well, we saw this, this woman with uh, not many clothes on. <laughs> and she's with another woman. So we thought we'd go back and have a look and see if we can, you know, catch him doing something. <laughs> uh, but, of course, they, she's drained the life force of this, this woman. And this woman lies on a, an autopsy table. And very like in Return of the Living Dead, where you've got the, hot, the female half cubs with their little waggling spine and a bit of a drip, a drippage of you know, spinal fluid coming out. And she's going on about her, the pain, the pain of being dead. And uh, But this one, after two hours, comes to life. And then they're all watching. <clears throat> explodes again. Baboomski! Yes, that one. This film is full of that, like. So the effects range from uh, intense visuals, spacey born stuff, and lots of practical, you know, makeup effects, which is why the film is so popular. It met with critical disdain, audience apathy at the time, but on home video it, it gained a life of its own and became a bit of a cult gem, which it definitely is. It has all these elements, but they don't all work, in fact very few of them work. And Steve Railsback, great as Charlie Manson. What the fuck is he doing in this? He goes from moments of complete, you know, almost zombie-like somnambulism to absolute fucking mania. Why are you doing this to me? Why? What are you doing? Why? Why? You're like, fuck, just calm down. A woman who has been the host for the female vampire at one stage, they track her down. But to drive out, you know, the influence of the, va the female vampire, he starts slapping around. He goes, you might want to leave the room to Commander Kane. And Commander Kane just sits there and goes like, no, I'm a natural voyeur. <laughs> what the fuck is going on? It is all over the show. But it is such a wonderful, wonderful movie in so many ways. The chaos in the streets is so well done. The hordes of running zombies are infected. It looks brilliant. You kind of wish there was more of that, in fact. It has a great opening a sagging middle section of detective stuff which by the way the book is a lot of detective stuff going on it doesn't have that big explosive finale it doesn't have any of that the book is very heady on concepts and ideas but it a, a bit like you know uh, uh, Lovecraft it doesn't depict everything it tells hints at things but the film goes OTT with trying to show you all this and it doesn't always work, but what does work, and let's do it again, is this theme, which really acts as a, a march and a clarion call for an era of filmmaking which is no longer with us. This is big, it's pomp, it's grandiose, it's ceremonial, it's militaristic. Don't think of vampires. Or Halley's Comet, which gets forgotten about. Halley's Comet, by the way, the original name for a comet, which I've forgotten, is actually translated as disaster because they were harbingers of doom, which of course this film really should play into. 
have his comments. Oh my God, you know, it, this, this, it's faith, it's destiny, it's the end of the world, it's the apocalypse, which is what this does become. Folks, from 1985, Life Force. Toby Hooper was all at sixes and sevens making this. Dan Jacoby, Dan O'Bannon. Everything got lost in the mix. And yet, it comes up with some great stuff, which is so memorable and so enjoyable, and just downright entertaining. And what a great cast as well. And Matilda May in the buff. I'm sold. You're sold. Zombies. Bat like creatures. And of course, a denoticed situation. And love on a level you couldn't comprehend. Folks, I have been and always will be Kiltman. Please go out and watch Life Force. Enjoy it, revel in it, craziness. And let me know what you think. In the meantime, I'm that space vampire infested in between time. Take it easy, be happy, be healthy. Keep it kilted, keep it Celtic. And I'm gonna see you all. when we're not so desiccated. <laughs>